Hello and welcome to the News Lab Office Hours uh, for Christmas, December, happy holidays to everybody around the world. And um, just like Santa, we will, instead of doing covering the whole globe in a night, we'll be covering some of it in the next hour. In um, Miami, we have uh, Alberto Cairo. Hello. Hi, Alberto. Hey, and, how are you? Uh, in, <clears throat> in Milan, we have Gabriel Rossi and Giorgio Lupi from Accurate. Hi. 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 And um, in, are you in Berlin or Hamburg? No, I live in beautiful Lilienthal. It's a small village in the north of Germany. Hi, I'm Moritz. Hi. So um, we have Moritz in Germany. So we're covering as much of the globe as we can in the next hour. And we're going to talk about the latest developments in DataViz and uh, the work that we've all been doing together this year, which has been a lot of fun. But um, as some of you know, joining these chats before, Alberto has been joining us this year. And we've been working very closely together on a number of visuals, haven't we, Alberto? And it's been, a, it's been an interesting year to be doing this, I would say. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I completely agree. It has a, a very interesting project in a very interesting year in terms of visualization and data journalism. It's been kind of, it's been kind of crazy. So we, um, one thing we decided to do a while ago was work with Alberto on trying to do some kind of really interesting visuals. And one of the teams we were really lucky to work with were Georgia and Gabrielle and Accurate team. Now, everybody who uh, knows anything about data this year and has followed uh, at least two people on this chat have been involved in the FT's top data viz books of the year. Um, but there's this, Dear Data, which <laughs> is a fantastic, um, just very human look at the world through data viz and two friends kind of communicating in, in data. And I'm bringing a kind of lovely kind of human touch to, to what can appear often to be a very dry and and um, you know, in human world, and I think that that's just for that you guys should should be awarded some kind of data viz Oscar. But um, I, I'm going to say hi to you guys. But you also want to introduce us to some of your team. Yeah, because well. actually, like uh, Gabriel and I normally um, are in our office in New York, but like now we are in Milan, and we love to um, welcome. They, they are going to they are going to show us the accurate army. Yes. <laughs> this is a very exciting moment for us. You're a little shy. Just, <laughs> just to show you that. Uh, hey, everyone. We have, we have a real company. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> no, that's a big team. <laughs> How many of you are there? Uh, a good two thirds of the company. So. <laughs> that's, big, that's bigger than the New York Times graphics desk. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah. uh, do, you guys, do you guys want to go around and say hi and just introduce yeah, yourself okay. and tell us what you do as well? Luca, hi. Giovanni, hi. Alberto. Giovanni, hi. I mean, hi. Hi, I'm Mara. Tommaso. Stefania. Hi, I'm Marco. Pietro. Tommaso. And I'm Cedere. Hello. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so fantastic. Well, hi guys. Thanks hi. so much for joining us. It's really good to see you, and you guys really rock, as we all know. You've been doing <laughs> fantastic work this year. So yeah, this is the team that actually was involved in in the creation of um, World Photos. So the, the project we've done together. So yeah, also because I mean, it was a, a nice experimental project for us. So we wanted uh, to have as many of them possibly work together on um, on this, um, and we we definitely had a lot of fun. But so it was really a team effort and between. Like, designers and, and developers here. So it, it's nice for us being in Milan. So kids watching this today, you can have a career in data visualization. It is possible. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. And actually, there are great schools here, as you know, like density design uh, has been one of our major sources of yeah, actually, yeah. Many, many of the people that you see uh, studied with Paolo Tuccarelli at Density Design, so uh, we have a, a great bond with, uh, with the lab and with Polytechnico. I think we're very lucky, like, being in Milan and having access to, this, you know, such talented students coming from Paolo's classes, so, yeah. Or living in Milan, period. You don't need to explain anything else, right? You guys are in New York as well, aren't you? So you're kind of, you've got these two offices, you're split around the globe. Exactly. Cool. Well, cool. well, well um, hi guys. Thank you. Well, nice you so while, while the team is saying goodbye, we actually have an example of the work that we did together. So one of the motivations for us at the News Lab was we really want to think, we have this budget for doing data visuals. What can we do that would be interesting and you know, take on the field of data journalism and develop new technologies 
but also you know find a way to tell stories around the big issues of the day or things that with Google Data that are interesting because this is, as a data set this is new as well. So I'm just going to share my screen a sec and show the world World POTUS, and hopefully um, many people will have seen this already. So you know you can see us. So this is uh, this is World POTUS, which is um, a lot of fun. The data ran for about how long did it run for? About a month, didn't it? Yeah, um, yeah it's more or less. It so was the, 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 the way the rest of the world looks or searches around the election. So this is data which was scraped every day, it's real time data. And you can see for Donald Trump where his um, searches were, and you can see them by country as well. And then you can click on different issues. So that's different issues to how people search with. The British and the candidates, these lovely kind of blobs are moving around, and you can click on the pages too and see more data about the countries as well. We actually use this a lot on election night because we just thought it was such an amazing, beautiful thing. Worth checking out for everybody. It's worldpotus.com. It still works. And there's lots of um, stuff on there about how we did the data, but I'm just going to stop sharing a sec. It's sharing into infinity there. That's cool. So, um, <laughs> Uh, Gabrielle and Georgia, talk a little bit about you know, how you felt when we initially came to you and, um, and how you kind of came up with the idea of doing this sort of visualization in the first place. Yeah, uh, I think I can start and then uh, definitely can have a conversation. So it was a very interesting conversation in the beginning with you and Alberto, and um, I believe that uh, one of the challenges was to find an angle uh, through which looking at the election which possibly wasn't so um, already explored. And it was also interesting because we were in a call with Alberto and Simon and Gabriele and I, we were all in the US, but actually we were all foreigners, right? Nobody of us was American. So I think that the idea of like, who would the rest of the world vote for? Like really looking for how um, this presidential election can, can are very important to all of the rest of the world was the basic entry point. Because if we if we know, I mean, we know that that everyone in the world is actually interested in um, the, the presidential election in the US. So I guess that this was really the jump, the jumping point. Yeah, to and the data. we got to the idea because a couple of years ago, we were talking with a friend who had this idea of like uh, setting up a website or something to see who would everybody else vote for. And we thought it was a great idea, but then, um, he never made it, but we kept talking about it. So the two things went well together. So, yeah. and also just just to add, um, I remember that in in, very, in our very first conversation, Alberto, we wanted also to build something that was mobile first. Yes. Like data visualization for mobile is not something that is like easy, easy in our mind to think about. Super, you know? super easy to use. That one, one that was one of our first goals. I remember hammering that not only with you but with everybody. Okay, oh. tell students mobile first. Worry about all the platforms later, but make it mobile, a mobile presentable in the mobile platform. Then you can worry about desktop or print or whatever. But first, mobile. And I think that these both projects that we have a, that we are going to be discussing today, both uh, World Potus and uh, the Rhythm of Food, uh, accomplish these really, really well. They work really well in mobile. It's a delightful. Both of them are delightful experiences. And there's something that I thought was very interesting that, uh, George, I think you said about the data, because the data is not something that's precise, it's very imprecise. And actually being able to, um, uh, to display it in a kind of imprecise way became really important to you, didn't it? Do you want to talk through that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think that also because we were using Google Google searches data to display something that is something like opinions on the elections, we of course knew that these results uh, were definitely they were totally not an indication of what people would actually vote. But still, there were really data that were good enough to visualize because there really um, is a value in understanding what people look for and search. And so we really. Um, we really try to prep, like to really push what we could do with this data also in a visual way to show this kind of like conversation around the topic of the election in this like purposely gobbly and bubbly and fuzzy way because it's not really important to visualize the index like behind um, the value. It's important to show the trends and to show how things change. And um, 
those uh, we like to say that we focus on a purposely soft depiction of data, trying to convey the message that it's not really important to see that if a difference from a bubble to another is like 52 or 53, it's important to really show um, this behavior of these bubbles that changes. Yeah, and also another uh, interesting anchor that we found uh, is the fact that we always like to find ways to include some sort of depiction of what the data stands for in our representation. Mm. And since conversations are, you can say, they are a block, something that is constantly moving, we think there's a nice uh, play. Yeah. You're, using the, you're using the comic book bubble metaphor, right? It, is yeah. a, it looks like conversation. I would intervene here to say that one of the great things about the project, I think, is that it, it, it certainly accomplishes that. It conveys the, the, the data, uh, the nature of the data, which is imprecise and et cetera. And certainly the bubbles work really, really well. But if you want precision, the precision is there because you can visualize the data as rankings and as bar charts. So, and this is something that both projects, again, Goral Potus and the Rhythm of Food, did really, really well. They first of all present the data in an engaging, fun, unusual, creative manner. But then if you are a little bit more, you know, square header like myself, right? I want to see things clearly, one, two, three, four, five, and compare things accurately. I can also get that. I can also switch the view and see it in a much more traditional way. And I think that this was another one, another one of the main goals that we had with all these projects, not just the mobile first approach, but also letting people decide how to see the data, right? In which ways they believe that they may be able to extract meaning from the data, because each person is different. Some people want the fun, the gist of the story, the general view of the data. Some other people are more interested in exploring the data depth, comparing things, correlating things, etc. right? And I believe that both projects accomplishes both, accomplish both goals. But then presenting data in new ways is challenging, right? Because people are used to seeing things like a map or, you know, a bar chart or a line chart or whatever. But you guys were taking, both of you, actually, all of all the people in the chat were taking a new approach to um, to visuals. And how, how important was that and how challenging was that for you guys? Because you were saying there weren't any libraries, you were having to come up with this whole thing from scratch. I mean, I think that like uh, we're touching upon very interesting topics here also because I know that we will be talking about trends uh, in data visualization. So both the idea of displaying uncertainty and, and then I know that Alberto, you also wrote a post on the importance to depict, really depict the, the imperfection of data because we know that data is, we know more and more that data is imperfect because it's primarily human made. But also the idea of depicting data in a sort of like non-conventional way, I think it's very important to all of what we do at Acura. Try to push a little bit forward what we can do with data visualization. Because if you think about it, it's not that we were born knowing how to read a scatter plot, right? But right. not everybody can read a scatter plot because it has been seen more and more. So I really believe that um, like a little bit of learning curve in the beginning from a reader, um, then like the benefit of having a little learning curve if you really explain how, how to interpret the data really outcomes the cons of engaging a little bit more with the visualization because then you can start seeing data uh, through a new lens, which is like probably a visual model that uh, is unconventional because it's tailored to the very data that you're working with. Yeah, and, uh, I, I could I could talk for hours about that. <laughs> no, I think, we talked we talked for hours. <laughs> yeah, I definitely want to come back to that. I think this is really interesting. But let's um let's share with everybody the biz that Moritz did with us as well. So I'm just going to share my screen again. And Which, this was the idea that Moritz, Moritz, you um you got to choose whatever you wanted to do, and you chose to to do food, didn't you? So <laughs> that's the rhythm rhythm of food dot net. It's got um. Google data going back to 2004, searches for food, bring all sorts of new kind of visual techniques into this. It's lovely uh, animation here. And you kind of you scroll down and then um, we, 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 we focused on December, first of all, because you know, we knew that this was going to be a, uh, come out in December. And so this is champagne, you see, which is something close to my heart. And um, you can see how, how search has changed and evolved over time. It's a really beautiful piece of work. and. Um, uh, and something kind of really special. But um, Maurice, can you talk a little bit about why you chose food to start off with? Yeah, that's a good question. So 
So I had a few food related projects in the past. It's one of my passions. So uh, I did something on muesli ingredients, for instance, a few years ago. And I also do uh, something called data cuisine, where we explore how we, we can express information through food, like basically edible charts and diagrams. So that sort of maybe was in the back of my mind. Um, but it came mostly because so it was clear from your side, OK, we want to do something with Google Trends data, because it's such an amazing data source. and. I agree, you know, there's so much we can learn from looking at Google searches. I think it's super much untapped potential there. And then I was thinking about, okay, what, what, what is a great match there? Like, what's a good topic that we can learn about from this data source? What, you know, what, what, what could work in this context? And I explored a few directions, but I kept coming back to cultural issues because what people actually search for and what they're actually interested in often has a lot to do with yeah what they do on a day-to-day -day basis or with cultural um, artifacts. And there's so much we can learn about the world by learning at how interesting cultural things uh, changes. And so I think food was a perfect like direction there because everybody's interested in food, everybody eats, and all the like all the nationalities all the different ethnicities all the different young people old people you know it it has so much to do with who we are and i was just super curious what we can learn there by just looking at data I about this everyday that. topic yeah yeah it's almost like you can look at everything through food from you know tourism immigration yeah. population change you know the aging of population and traditions changing over time globalization it's all all there within in that data set isn't it yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. so I, remember, super rich. I remember when we began working on this project and Moritz shared <laughs> the first the first sketches of the project, which were basically time series land charts of, of, of searches for food. And I was like I was like, Wow, this is amazing because you could clearly see the seasonal patterns. And in, in many of the in many cases were strikingly similar. I mean there were like repeated patterns, repeating peaks and valleys all the time up and down they were so clear and so spectacular i mean they they they, they, they were they were really really wonderful and i believe moritz that you that you wrote a um a making of post about about the rhythm of food in which you showcase some of these early sketches right right so the on my website uh, truthandbeauty.net there's a little write-up on yeah, what the process was and what some of the design rationale for some of the ideas in the project were and yeah, as you said in the beginning, I like to go very broad, like just start with a theme and a basic question and then explore in all kinds of directions, both conceptually, but also what does the data tell us, right? Like what what can we learn from the data? What are interesting patterns we can spot? And so we looked at a couple of things like regional differences or um, trends over the years, like we have 12 or actually 13 years of data uh, that we can use, right? So. We can also learn a lot about long-term trends. So I'm, there's I'm a little bit in the beginning well. of the site. Charts that look like food is still my favorite bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this, this is yeah the because all like totally accidental discoveries, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's uh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> the they, look, they look like they look like cereals floating in a bowl of milk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so in there the beginning go. it wasn't clear what take we will have on the topic of food but then as alberto said when we saw these line charts where i drew one line per year and there were these super interesting patterns it was like yeah we need to do it about seasonality and so the main question really of the project is what are the seasonal patterns in food that we can learn about and they are super interesting like every every food has its own shape basically there is a lesson to be learning what Mo what Moritz is saying right now, which is that data visualization is not just about presenting facts to people. It is about discovery. It's about unveiling what what hides behind behind the data. Sometimes and there is a whole branch of statistics built around this idea, right? Exploratory data analysis, right? Defined by Tucky yeah. back in the seventies or something. I mean, it's like you in many cases you cannot see what lies behind the data unless that you visualize it. And this this example, this project is a perfect example of that. I mean, we already knew more or less that probably the data the data was seasonal. But the evidence for that assertion only strikes mm. you once mm. you actually see it depicted. Yeah. And how, how it is seasonal, how it is seasonal. This is what how you can see, right? The, the simple fact is clear, but 
How exactly? And some were as expected, some were surprising. And how strongly seasonal is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and each is different, as I said. So, and what yeah. looking back, what was funny in this project to me was this exploratory phase was very long. Like I took really my time to to flesh out that topic and which food do we take exactly and what what's the angle we take. Then it took maybe a few days to come up with that chart. You know, so the chart design very short. Like that was once a new should be seasonal was pretty straightforward and then we spent literally months in just you know thinking about the narrative and all the annotations and how to structure the experience and add all the details that really make the site work so the funny thing is like actually designing the chart was maybe five percent of the actual efforts and all the rest was you know coming up with the basic angle and then coming up with the narrative and the whole framing of that idea so there's, there's something very interesting i think obviously you said there about you know Data isn't just about presenting facts. But the fact is that there are a whole set of fundamentalists, uh, data viz fundamentalists out there who believe that exactly that uh, data viz is just about presenting facts and you should do it in as dry a way as possible. Um, what would you well, I mean, yeah, it, it, that? It, I, I would say that it's about presenting facts, but it's about presenting facts to different kinds of people. Sometimes you need to present oh. facts to yourself, right, in order to be able to see those facts, right? What do you think, Moritz? Absolutely, and I mean, also what uh, um, Georgia and Gabriele were touching on, what is the basic message people get? And what is the first impression? What is the visceral, the emotional response to something is as important, maybe even more important than the actual explicit representation of facts, you know, because tables are great for representing those numbers, but what that means to us or which patterns we can see or what the general impression is we get. This is something where visualization is great, and this is something highly nonlinear, very personal. You know, we're, we're coming into the realm there of the poetic and the artistic and the, the not so easily graspable. And yeah. I think this is why we're all doing it, because it's so, it's so not so, straightforward. You know, so I, I have, yeah, it's I such have, a rich world to explore. Is a, is a big question, which mm -hmm. is that right now, politically around the world, there is this big move against elites, okay, and against intellectualism. Yeah. And in favor of kind of populism and, and facts are, in general. Well, yeah, we can get onto that as well. But um, <laughs> in terms of design, when you're designing something, are you designing for you know a undefined user? Are you thinking this is going to be as popular as wide as possible, or is this really designing? Are we do we end up designing for our peers because we end up designing for people that we know because we want you know, our peers to respect what we've done, mm -hmm. or is it like some weird combination of everything? What do you guys think? And I'm, yeah, Gabriel and, and, and George, you come too, but Marius, what do you think about that? I think people are pretty smart. That's like that's my basic assumption. And my experience is also that also like everyday people on the street can get really complex facts and situations and multidimensional stuff if it's presented in the right way and if there is a road into it. Like if you just confront people with a block of messy uh, details, you know, then everybody's a bit like, oh, I don't know what to do with that. But if there's a clear road into understanding or at least having a sense, I, I'm interested in that and, and I will figure this out, then in my experience, people love complex stuff. You know, they love figuring something out and they can also deal with uh, maybe two opposing views as part of the da same data set or some cognitive dissonance or some, you know, some complexity. So I, I really believe... Um, Humans are really good at that. <laughs> you know, if, if we give them a, actually a chance. So, I, Gab Gab Gabriel and Georgia, what do you guys think? And also, um, your project, I think, it strikes an incredible balance of this because um, at a first sight, these are like very complex shapes. You don't recognize them, but thanks to the legend, but also the contextual animations that are great in showing without any word how you can read uh, the graph. You get this, this feeling that like, as soon as you realize, you solve the puzzle, then the big picture becomes clear because you then can compare the different uh, graphs. And I think we have a visual mind. And like, in the same way, we learn how to recognize uh, a ripe fruit because of the visual features. Something very similar trick triggers in our mind when we unlock the code and immediately 
all the different foods, and you can tell that this one was popular uh, five years ago, but now it's less popular, and you recognize the shapes, and it's so immediate once you unlock it, and it doesn't really take much to do it. So I absolutely agree with Mark what uh, Mark says. And there is, there is joy in discovery, right? There is joy, yeah, there, is exactly. joy there is joy in understanding how to read something. It's like when yeah. you're reading, you reading a book about a complex topic and suddenly you grasp it, you say, wow, this is so amazing. I mean, Georgia, <laughs> Georgia before mentioned, mentioned the scatter plot. I remember the first time that I saw a scatter plot, I said, how, how do I read this? And then I, it took me, you know, I'm not that smart, so it took me a little bit to understand it. But once I understood it, I said, this is so nice. This is incredible, right? This is so amazing. It's like that sense of um, empowerment. It's like you. It's like the, the graphic is making you smarter in some sense, but yeah. you access what hides behind the data. There is something important in that. There is also something important in that. And going back to, I just want to interrupt here because there's one thing that Simon uh, put on the table and Moritz and, and Georgia talked about it, which is this emotional component of visualization. Right? I don't think that there's a there's an ongoing conversation right now about if visualization can raise empathy and all that kind of stuff. I, I have a lot of things to say about that. I don't think that visualization is useful for that. But it can it can it can, it, it, it visualization certainly has an emotional component. The, the the visual aspect, the visual presentation of the information is also part of the functional part of the graphic. It's also one of the elements that makes a graphic good. So now that, as you know, I'm writing my PhD dissertation, which I'm planning to finish in February, crossing my fingers and publish it for free online next summer or something like that. One of the chapters deals with the history of a news visualization, with the history of news infographics and visualization. And one of the things that I talk about is the mood swings in the news industry. So back in the 80s, if you remember, it was all Nigel Holmes, USA Today, you know, pictorial charts with funny illustrations and the line chart on the back. And, and then you had the Tufty backlash, right? You have Tufty, Edward Tufty publishing his book saying, no, 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 just about the data, just clean it up, all super clean, all super straightforward. Uh, and, and we have lived in the um, in, in this Taftian dream for 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 very very long, and now I believe that the pendulum is swinging back, perhaps to the middle point, to a middle oh. point that is much more rational, not that radical, right? Uh, and I'm going back to this idea that the emotional part, the beautiful part of the of the graphics, are also important. It's not just about efficiency, right? Depending on the context, there are some contexts in which. Uh, full efficiency is absolutely necessary. For example, in business analytics, but 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 in presentation, right? That component, that emotional component, is incredibly important. So we are we are experiencing these these so, right so now. So interesting. I mean, I grew up with like Dorling Kinsley, you know, cutouts, cutaways. I've always loved cutaways. I've been I've had a fondness for cutaways as as we were telling you working with me on graphics desk was on the Guardian. I love I love those, and I think there is that thing of something appealing to your heart because mm -hmm. you know we talk mm -hmm. you know if um if Politics now teaches anything. It's about the importance of opinion to heart as well as head. Um, and I think there's something really vital about that. So that actually leads us nicely onto what I want to talk about, this kind of humanity of data. So anybody, this is just for people out in the world who have not uh, consumed this from cover to cover yet. It's a really beautiful um, set of, uh, of, of, of visual, very personal visuals. But it's not the only thing that's come out at you in that way. Something else that um, I've got, and this probably reveals my... My um, my own personal biases, but visualizing the Beatles is. Oh damn! Collection. I need to order that. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. It's a collection of data visuals around everything from this. So this shot here, for instance, it's about the keys of different songs, for instance. And then um, this is just me picking stuff at random. Oh, this is the style, changing color stars. This is quite cool. This is volume and intensity of different tracks wow. over time. So this, you know, this is very kind of emotional, appealing, human data visuals. You know, it's like literally Edward Tuff would have a heart attack if he if he kind of got delve into these. But I mean, so George, I know you've written a lot about kind of humanizing humanizing data. But do you want to talk a little bit about about what you were trying to do with the Dear Data project and how and how that's really struck a chord now? Yeah, well, sure. Well, thank you for <laughs> for showing the book. I mean, uh, with Dear Data, of course, like it was a personal project, a collaboration with great, great information designer Stephanie Pozovic. And the reason why we decided to collaborate and to start sending each other's uh, 
this kind of like hand-drawn data posters is that people realize that both, we both really share a very handcrafted approach to data and we really spend a lot of time with our data, like mainly because we don't code, like both, like neither Stephanie nor I, we cannot code. And uh, so we spent hours from Excel to Adobe Illustrator and really creating data visualizations that are extremely customized, you know, and tailored to the data that we're working with because we cannot, you know, use presets that are live into tools. And so I think that we wanted to try to really challenge how you can um, get very extreme and radical to removing the technology from the equation and see what happens if you really literally just use a pencil and uh, a piece of paper to draw data. And also, we wanted to challenge the personality of the data world and all this like, quantified self-movement. So we conceived our data from the beginning more as a personal documentary. And we used our personal data to actually get to know each other. Because before starting the data, we didn't know each other. We only met twice in our life. Right. I, I think I think there is something interesting there because you know people have done very personal data before. We, you know people document their lives and how much the water they've drunk and how many miles they've walked and so on. But what you did was do it in a very human style. That feels different to me. I think it was also um, sharing a lot about ourselves because if you go through our topics, sometimes we cover pretty intense topic like our envies for a week or mm. our next thoughts and we were completely honest to one another and also now to all of our readers about what is going on in our minds in form of data and I really feel that I mean we are so happy because the project had had a great response by people a lot of people learned about the project really like we've, we've seen hundreds if not thousands of postcards of people that learned about the project and wanted to experiment on themselves and also teachers that are using this format to teach their students even like primary school teachers or secondary school te teachers to teach their students the word of data. And I believe that that was possible because we really touched upon topics that are humane, how about who we yeah. are as human beings instead of just like calories count or I don't know. I, I think that because it was extremely personal and because we put all of ourselves into the project, it could resonate with people so well. And there is something just about... Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay, I'll, you I'll, just okay, did two I'll mega turn, turns. Alberto, then, Alberto, then, then Morris. Okay. okay, I was about to say that uh, going back to this idea of uh, drawing things by by hand, and that that makes the product so the the data so appealing. Uh, but there's also we can put this again in a historical perspective. I mean, if you go to the um, if you go to the history of of info, information graphics in the news, there is people in the news who have said the same thing for quite a long time. You know, people like Fernando Baptista, Juan Velasco, uh, Adolfo Aranz, all are, those are all people who do pictorial explanation infographics that are drawn by hand, or, or um, Jaime Serra from Spain. I mean, they all draw by hand. And their graphics are incredibly warm. I cannot find a better word to describe them. They, 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 there's something warm about them. When I do that kind of that same kind of graphic, as I am not very good at hand drawing, I just use three D modeling. I, I model my things in three D, etc. But they look plasticky. They, they they look unnatural. They look like machines, etc. They look they look like the when you draw something by hand, something some, so, suddenly that something becomes more um, more real in some sense. I don't know how to explain it better, but it, it makes the graphic more approachable. It's true. I mean, it's worth kind of shouting out to Mona Chalabi's. Instagram feed, if anybody has not follow that. That's very I mean, similar. I mean, obviously, probably slightly more focused on sex than, um, than your work, but basically, yeah, there's a ton of stuff in there. Yeah, she's just won a really well deserved um, Royal Statistical Society Award for that, and it's very much about open and But Moritz, you were coming in and I cut you off. Oh, I basically wanted to touch on the same point. I think much of the success, and the success was huge. So if you don't know it, the data was like a mega hit, basically. Um, I think it managed to hit two nerves. And the one is big data skepticism and this general like move away from just throwing a lot of data and machines at a problem mm. and yeah, rethinking a bit and bringing in a human approach. And the second one is really this huge move towards the analog again. So we've been doing so much digital only stuff that now Everybody's longing for photography, drawings. I just bought a pen plotter. You know, I want to draw again <laughs> with, uh, you know, but with machine support. Um, people do sculptures, 3D printing. So I think these are two really, really big trends. And 
your project you know brings those so nicely together and That's i think so, this is why it resonates with everybody it's, so, it's so true everybody everybody should know that vinyl sales are now higher than cd sales in the uk which look is at that yeah look high. at that yeah. so i um, just want to say anybody watching this at home you can get involved in this conversation too on the right of your little youtube window there's a live chat so post questions from there a couple of people have i'm actually going to bring a couple of those in and or tweet us on, on Twitter at, uh, at Google News Lab, and we will try and get around to them. But we do actually have a couple of questions. So um, this uh, I'm going I'm to go with one for Moritz first. So this is from Quentin Lapape, I think. Lapap. Um, when designing visualizations that show the whole world's a map, do you ask yourself what projection to use, or do you just go for Mercator as it's the one that most people know? When I can, I avoid Mercada because it has a few really oh, obvious wow. downsides. And yeah. I think it's a huge issue, and it totally plays into what we discussed before. What is the, let's say, non-explicit impression people get? Yeah, And this has a lot to do with how you draw your map. Like, Do you choose a projection that optimizes for being area uh, trustworthy or... Uh, what is in the center of the map? Europe is not the natural center of the world. It's an arbitrary decision made by map makers. Oh. Uh, we can, you know, we can also put Asia into the top, into the center of the map. How does that change things? Um, so, and another really important question is how, what is the abstraction of your map? Like, is the actual polit political landscape the topic? Is the physical scape the topic? Or do I just need a rough orientation? It is the actual data overlay the story and this will if you're conscious about that like dictate a lot of how the style of the map should be and just like dropping a few markers on google uh, maps or google earth is a good start especially for exploration but if you want to really make the data shine often it can be a good idea to to put some extra crafting into the map and the projection alberto what do you think about this the the great <laughs> makata map question well, yeah, well, I have written extensively about that <laughs> um, in my latest book. So, I mean, when you're, as Moritz said before, I mean, no map is perfect and no map, no map projection accomplishes everything that you need to accomplish. So some map projections sacrifice area. I mean, they, they make areas unrealistic, but they make object shapes or landscape shapes accurate, right? So you need to decide. There is always a trade-off. In, in maps. Also, where you place the, the projection of the map, as Moritz said. I mean, there is not a reason why we cannot, you know, put Australia in the center of in the center of the map. If we, we could use a planar map and then put Australia in there, right? So a map is like any any other kind of visualization. You need to ask yourself what the map is for, right? What what is it that I'm trying to show yeah. on the map, right? And depending on that, on the answer to that question, uh, you can you can guide your choices uh, depending on that. It's the same thing as, as deciding between a bar chart or a map, right? I mean, see, if you want to rank and compare things, don't do a, a map. Do a bar chart and a rankings because a rank it's a ranking, right? So do a ranking, right? This really reminds me of there's a, a piece I did with Jenny Ridley. Um, Jenny, if you're watching this, this is Jenny's graphic artist at the Guardian, and this was about looking at the world through different uh, foreign policies. So, you know, mm -hmm. so who, which countries are important for the US by the number of embassies that they have, which countries are important for the UK by the number of embassies they have, or for Russia, or for, um, you know, for South Africa, or whatever. And so for each globe, we moved the, the map. So it was the, that country was in the center of the globe, and it was looking around it. This was, this was um, Jenny and uh, Paul Scruton, I think. And, and it's changed how you see the world. It's so weird looking at a map, which is, is different to, to the ones that we all grow up with. But I know with um, Gavril and Georgia, you, um, for World POTUS, you skewed a map, didn't you? You literally, there were no maps in World POTUS, even though it's a world geography. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I know we had a lot of discussion about that, didn't we, before, before we published? Yeah, one of the ideas uh, behind that was actually to let, let you play with geography. So uh, we have some sort of geography, but it's just a planner space. <laughs> and you see the bubbles, and you have... I'd say three types of geography. One is based on um, similarity between uh, similarity in searches across all of the topics between uh, the different countries. So you can arrange the bubbles in a geography that is based on how similar countries are. Then you have a view that is called atlas, that it's more literal. So it's 
loosely based on a geographical position, but it's uh, there's no map projection. It's just we just pick the centroids of the different uh, continents and arrange the bubbles around them, just to give a sense of how patterns can be found ma matching with real geography. And then we have another view that it's based on trends rising and falling. So a new geography that is based on what is trending up and what is trending down. So I yeah. like the geographical metaphor was something we really played with. I remember that one of the first tests was our idea was to use the same data instead of displaying bubbles, like distort uh, a world map to bring countries closer. Because um, what we wanted to explore, for example, was something like, what if uh, Mexico, where the, the border and immigration it's maybe similar to Syria and Turkey. They should stay close together because they search for that topic in a very similar way. Uh, or yeah, I think that I, like I also remember that it, it was a little bit of a harm wrestling between all of us because we there was a certain point where we didn't want to include the actual geography. We were like, no, we should just really work on a distorted geography based on the similarities of search between the countries. But then I think that we all convened that it was good to have an actual map. One of the three views being something that readers could just go back to and understand and then play with these new geographies on the other two views. And in a sense, we're like, those bubbles are a new map of the world because you have a country that is a bubble and the size of the country is based on the interest and then you can arrange them in different maps mm -hmm. of the world based on, not on real geography, but on something else. I, I remember feeling really anxious about it. <laughs> Because, because it's something new, right, and different and okay. challenging for that because you're seeing the world as, as bubbles and, and it's tricky to understand. But I think I'm really glad that you pushed that because I think it's, it's so much stronger and better as a result. This yeah, is the, 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 the hidden process of creating data visuals, right? It's all that to and throwing. Exactly. Stuff, doesn't, stuff rarely just ends up on a screen or on a, on a piece of paper in front of you. The process yeah, behind I just, it. Yeah, like, I think that Alberto... Um, was was great in like this sort of like moderation of a conversation because of course <laughs> as Alberto you said it's it's nice that you have these layers and both with also like Maurice's project and our project um uh, you, we, you you have these new layers when you first jump in and explore something that is completely new but then if you want to have a more conventional representation to really just be familiar and understand you have this further layer that uh, it, it's, it's kind of like building something novel upon something that it's familiar. So it's yeah. like doing baby steps to try to even teach people how uh, visualizations can be something more than they um, have experienced already, but still providing with the base, the base layer that they are familiar with. And the final decision was based on prioritizing the surprise effect over the familiar form, right? Which is, I believe, is the right choice. I mean, there's also a case to be made to put the map first so people can, can find something you know, uh, something secure to hold on to in order to understand the graphic. But I think that is value. There is value in switching that and, and, and actually uh, making people feel a little bit, just a little bit unsecure about what they are seeing. So they feel just a little bit, not too much. So they feel prompted to explore a little bit. Say, well, what is this bunch of bubbles, right? What is, what is this bar graph doing here on the right-hand side in the desktop version? And then suddenly, with just you know, 10 seconds of thinking, they realize that they are actually connected to each other, and then they, they can navigate the project in, in different ways. So there's not a reason why we shouldn't challenge readers a little bit. Challenging readers is the only way people can learn more uh, vocabulary. Of visualization. Are we, are we well. saying readers rather than users? That's so interesting. Sorry? Yeah. Are there any they're saying readers rather than users? It's really interesting. I say readers all the time because that's how yeah, I, I say grew readers, up working yeah. in the newspaper. But we said we say readers as well, maybe because also we, we, when we started working at Accurate, we've been working for two years with the newsroom of the Sunday Cultural Supplement of Corriere della Sera. So even for us, our users are our readers, even if we build something that is interactive. Yeah. In my case, it's because I believe that people read these yeah. That's right. So what, 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 what do you think, Marius? Do you say readers or users? I often say users. I try to say people because I think this yeah. is the, the best perspective to have. Yeah, but people, often, yeah. I think in terms of users still. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I think it so shows we, everybody's backgrounds. Yeah. We have a couple um, of questions actually coming, which is nice. So 
Um, Shahir Shahar, Shaheen, sorry, Shahir Shaheen has asked, are there plans to put the news lab visualization tools capabilities within the hands of many, uh, making them integratable for developers, for example? So actually, I do have an answer to that, which is that um, a lot of our stuff is on our GitHub page, which is the Google Trends GitHub page, really easy to find, and um, all the code for World Potus is on there. I don't think it's on there for Rhythm of Food, although we should, um, we should try and do that. We're also looking at whether um, there are tools. So for instance, the Kiln guys in London are working on a tool called Flourish, which is where you, you um, upload a data visualization type, and then you can add any data you want to it as long as it's in the right format so to make the, our visuals more kind of accessible. I'd really like to be able to do that this year. So definitely, uh, Shahir, we're really into opening up data as much as possible and getting people to, to use it and be able to create their own vi visual versions Data, whether it's or not it's with Google Data, I don't mind. I just wanting to put tools out there in, into the world. And creating tools um, for non-coders, right? Like Tyler. Exactly. So, uh, for yeah. people like non-eng, as they call them yeah. in Google, non-eng people. <laughs> um, so we, we have a couple more questions. So um, there's a big one that I'm going to come to in a bit because it's too big to answer quickly. But John Schwebisch um, writes, there is an article from SciAm today, how science visualization can help save the world. Do you think that better science visualization can save the world? And Maurice, I'm going to go to you first for that. Saving the world is always a big task. <laughs> 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 but I, I agree, it's like one of the big topics is like how can we transfer like complex findings from highly specialized domains, you know, that affect our planet, for instance, like climate change, um, and make that information digestible, actionable, and get more people involved in, in these topics. And the hope is generally that visualization can play a crucial role there. And I think, for instance, in climate science, it really has shown this year that if you visualize right, people get a grasp of what's going on. And, um, and again, talking about, we talked about cartography so much, I think, giving people a mental model of how to think about the world and how this world is changing, you know, is super crucial um, in order to just cope with all the, <laughs> this massive change that is going on. So, um, but I don't think it will be visualization alone. So it needs to be this combination of, um, yeah, being good at communication in general and storytelling and finding out what people actually are interested in and finding good visual models, interaction, making sure to work with the scientists. So it's, I don't think visualization is like a, a, a so how do you say, a silver bullet, but it, it will definitely be um, a super important part of that. That's so interesting. So uh, Georgia and um, Gabrielle, what do you guys think? Can data save the world? <laughs> well, hopefully. <laughs> no, um, I think that um, one interesting um, point of view is from Enrico Bertini and you know what is you know him very well of course um, I remember that at a conversation that we were speaking at together he so he is a computer scientist but he's a researcher and a professor at the NYU University and uh, he was really talking about his collaboration with scientists and they come to him to say can you just like build a nice chart for my paper but there's so much more to that and I think it's so also about how you communicate this whole scientific research so I, I don't really have an answer but I'd like to put this thought here that like how you really communicate the results of a complex and a compound research uh, will be, um, I think, will be dramatically affected by data visualization in the future. Because now the only format to share scientific knowledge is a paper that needs to have this format because it needs to have peer to be peer reviewed that needs to have these standards. But I really believe that if we start adding this layer of visual communication to that, we can really reach a broader audience in a definitely less amount of time. Um, it, I don't have an answer, but I really believe that this is something that will be, uh, a, you know, a, a nice direction to experiment on in the future. I think that scientific visualization and non-scientific visualization should work together to save the world because uh, sometimes we only rely on like hard facts and very precise numbers but the world is messy so okay. i think we can save the world when we find the right balance between hard numbers and human emotions and in the fact that you cannot predict everything so uh, combining uh, a very proper scientific visualization also with 
some sort of visualization that uh, includes the knowledge that the world is imperfect can maybe save the world. I don't, I don't know how, but... And I think it's all about reaching a broader audience, like getting more people to know what is behind this research. And remember, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of like bringing up another topic here, but I remember, Alberto, that you um, sort of like replied or quoted one of my tweets by saying, is data visualization becoming mainstream or is data visualization mainstream? And um, I don't know, like certainly data is more and more mainstream. Like if like, I don't know, 10 years ago or five years ago, we would hear the word big data only in IT businesses context or like um, consultancy context. Now everyone talks about being data driven, even uh, creative agencies or media e agencies, they, they, they write on their website that they are data driven, right? And, and then also more and more, um, the world is, com not the world, but like, a lot of organizations are converging towards design. So for example, big companies like IBM or consultancies like McKinsey, they are really hiring hundreds of designers or buying design companies. So just like data being already mainstream and having this other design that design approach is becoming mainstream definitely is bringing data visualization to be more and more mainstream. But Alberto, what do you think about that? Well, I, I do believe that data visualization is going mainstream. I am not really sure that it's becoming mainstream for everybody. It's certainly becoming mainstream in our world. I mean, the world of, generally speaking, you know, highly educated people who live in mostly in cities and who enjoy reading and, and talking to each other about philosophy, science, data, and things like that, right? Uh, that doesn't make us better than anybody else, but I do believe that visualization is certainly not becoming mainstream, uh, at least not in the right way, uh, among people who don't share our values or our knowledge. And that, that is something that really worries me, because if there is something that the recent election has be, um, made clear is that there is an educational gap, I would actually say an educational divide that is leading to also a cultural and social social divide, not only in the United States, but every, everywhere else. I have seen this phenomenon in Spain. I, we certainly see it in Britain. I have seen it in Brazil. I see it in many different places. Mm -hmm. And I must say, I mean, visualization is becoming more common for people who read the New York Times, the Washington Post, people who read the projects that we that we publish, and that is wonderful. That is a reason to keep doing the things that we do. But at the same time, I believe that we need to think about more how to communicate well with people who have never seen a visualization in their lives or don't know, you know, I, I have even seen people who cannot interpret that 0 0.5 million means half a million. Mm. I have seen that firsthand. And not only among people who don't have bachelor's degrees. I have seen this kind of uh, this kind of lack of knowledge among journalists in some cases, right? I among our own pride and ignorance with um, in newsrooms still, I would I would argue. But I think um, it's interesting that we are all sitting in countries that have either had elections in the last few months or are about to have one, looking at um, where it's there with uh, elections in Germany this year. And um, and this kind of leads into actually one of the last, probably the last question we have time for today, which is what will DataViz look like in the coming decades? So what do we think is going to happen next? Bearing in mind the kind of context, the, the fact context that we're in at the moment where that we see data visualizations, I use the word loosely, which are fake or not true, but they, they are out there and people, people call them stuff. But what do we think is going to happen with data visualization? Do we think it's going to be just something of the coastal elites or is it is it something that that you know, we think has the potential to, to do better than that. I'm gonna say, let's start off with Georgia. <laughs> um, I, it's a tough question for sure. I think, um, I don't know, probably now what comes to my mind is really my experience with Dear Data, when we have seen like really young kids drawing their data and people who definitely probably didn't even know what data was that we're starting to just like count their activities and like visually map their activities. So um, I think that, and again, this particular very, very drastic limit of technology that we impose to ourselves, uh, sort of like brought the idea of data visualization being more accessible. 
being that you don't need to like be a statistician or a programmer to start approaching the data world and as i know that stephanie stephanie always says that to use data as the creative material for any kind of project so um um I, I don't think I'm answering to the question, but like I think there's something that still strikes me every time that I see a data postcard from a person who does something completely different in their life. So there is the possibility to do, um, you know, to really involve um, other audiences, not only to read data visualization, but to make data visualization. If we probably change the conception of what a data visualization is because a data visualization can really be just like tiny symbols that represent who you are and what you do and not necessarily something that is like depicting over complicated phenomena. Do you have ideas? Yeah, um, I mean, I think we still have to digest what happened uh, with this round of election. Yeah. And probably visualization will change. Like, uh, I'd be curious to see how someone like 538 will cover and will dissect all the polls <clears throat> in the next election because something has to change because we were too tied to those numbers so as if they really represented reality they did actually because everywhere it said that it's a percentage of like possible win so it was actually very correct but at the same time wasn't people probably weren't able to engage in the right way with that sort of representation so i don't know what where and how it will evolve but it has to address this problem so guys i'm afraid our time is up um thank you so much for joining us from germany we have morris tafana from mohan we have george lupin gabriel rossi and from miami alberto cairo and this is simon rogers from san francisco just saying, um, have a great holiday period. I hope you all have holidays. And thank you guys so much for joining us. And please carry on the conversation on social media. And we will see you next time. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thanks so much. Bye. See you guys.